I am choosing to go. I am choosing to follow Jesus. I am choosing to obey the Great Commission. I am choosing to love the way that he first loved us. I will not settle for anything less. I am choosing to be a disciple of Jesus. <laughs> Bucky. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 73, 25 and 26. Whether you're here in Richland or watching online or at Portage, I want us all on the count of three to say desire. One, two, three. Desire. 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 Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger, thirst, Matthew 5, 6. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. Jesus I want us now to shout the name that's above every name, and that's Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. Jesus. Desire, hunger, thirst, Jesus. I'm going to say it again so you get it. Desire, hunger, thirst, Jesus. Mmm, Jesus. Our heart's desire, what our soul longs for, the very appetite of our lives finally fulfilled in the person of Jesus. If you're a believer, you have something to shout about because you have what your heart has been longing for. Amen. Which begins, which leads us now to how we began the disciple series. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn with me to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning with verse 29. Desire, hunger, thirst, Jesus. John, chapter 1, beginning with verse 29, the Word of God says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world. This is John the Baptist. John wants everyone to see what he saw, who he saw. John sees Jesus coming and shouts, behold him, see him. Don't look at me. I'm not even worthy to tie his flip-flops. Look at him. I must decrease. He must what? Increase. Don't look at me. Behold this Jesus. All hail King Jesus. John declares that Jesus is the very Lamb of God. Now, why does that matter? Because in this world, in this life, the world can give us and offer us a lot of things in this life, but the world can't take away our sin, which will keep us from having eternal life. Behold Jesus. See Jesus. Now look down at John chapter 1, verse 35. Look a couple of verses down. Verse 35, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and as he walked by and said, behold the Lamb of God. So sometimes the Bible repeats itself because we need it, right? So he sees Jesus again, behold the Lamb of God. Look at him. I want you to get him. I love what John says. John is pointing them to the one who he said is far greater than him. He's saying, the one that's coming after me, he's going to baptize you with fire, and all you know right now is water. This is something other. Jesus is different, different. This is the one. So let's see how they respond. Verse 37, I love this. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? 
So imagine this. You hear, you're there. You hear the arrival of the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. And not only do you hear it, but you see this Jesus. You see this man with your very eyes. And you stop what you're doing and you begin to follow him. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how long they were following him. But can you imagine that? Like, yo, that's Jesus. Yo, that's Jesus. And you just begin to follow him. And Jesus turns the Bible says he turns and he looks at them and says, what are you seeking? Imagine that Jesus just walking, doing what he does, turns, captures their attention, says, what are you seeking? Another way of saying that is this, what do you want? A hood way, what you want? <laughs> what do you want? Like really, what do you want? What a powerful question from the world's most powerful person. Think about that. Imagine if Jesus was here in the flesh, and listen, they had some idea of who he was, so their answer had to contain some type of truth. And Jesus looks you in the eye and says this, what are you desiring? What do you hunger and thirst for? How would you respond? How would you respond? when the very love of God personified is looking at you in your eyes and saying, hey, what do you want? What do you really want? These disciples answered Jesus with another question. It goes on later in verse 38, it says, and they said to him, I love this, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now they're not concerned with the location Pastor Lee spoke on this. They're not concerned about where he's going. No, they're saying this. Jesus, wherever you are, that's where I want to be. Wherever you are, I want to be there. So I love this. If we put this together, right, Jesus asked them, what do you want? You know what the disciples say? We want you. We want you. Oh, I love that. Jesus, what do ask you, what do you want? Can you honestly, from the depths of your heart, say, I want you. This is the creator of the world. You know he can give you anything you desire, and you say, hey, all I desire is you. I want you. Here's my first point for today is this. Disciples want Jesus. You want to be a disciple? Disciples want Jesus. Jesus, disciples desire, hunger, thirst after Jesus. So how does Jesus respond to this question? How is Jesus, is he going to say, nah, not really? How is he going to respond? Look at verse 39. It says, he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. What I love about Jesus is this. Jesus doesn't reject their request to be with them. He doesn't reject them at all. And he also invites them to come be with him, stay with him, and follow him wherever he goes. Now, this truth mattered then, and it matters now. God is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. And the reason why I want to harp on this truth is this. Jesus did not and does not reject those who want him. Jesus did not and does not reject those who want him him. Let me remind you of the gospel. The gospel teaches us that God pursued us, revealed perfect love to us through the person of Jesus. And what do we do? We rejected him. But that rejection led to a cross. Then it led to a resurrection that made the relationship with God possible. So if you're here today and you really want Jesus, I can promise you this. He won't reject you because he was already rejected to have you. Can I get an amen? Somebody in here. If you're afraid that Jesus is going to reject you, he's like, too late. Already happened. You've already offended me. You never deserved this. That's why I came to offer grace. Don't be afraid. For those who really want Jesus, go after him. He wants you to follow him more than you want to follow him. I guarantee you that. Why? Because he knows what he has in store for you. I love when I have surprises for my kids. And my daughter's sick. She goes, Daddy, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> it's going to be glorious. <laughs> even though she's happy, she's like anticipating something, she doesn't even know what it is. I know what it is. And I'm like, it's going to be great. Right? 
Jesus wants you to follow him way more than you want to follow him. He won't reject you. What a privilege it is to be a disciple of Jesus. It's amazing. I love what I get to do. I get paid to be a Christian. Most of you do it for free. It's awesome, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sorry, Pastor Lee. I'm sorry. <laughs> I throw that in. It's pretty cool. But what is a disciple? Pastor Lee did a phenomenal job defining a disciple is someone who finds, follows, and is becoming fully formed to be like Jesus. But here's the thing. Why would anyone find, follow, or be formed by something or someone that they don't really want? Why? Simply put, we won't become like Jesus if we don't like Jesus. We won't become like him if we don't like him. I'm not trying to speak about your family, at least I'll talk about mine. But in my family, I have family members who I love, but I don't like. You laugh and you might be sitting next. Anyway, but there's people in your family. You say, hey, I love you, but you don't like them. And because you don't like them, you don't pursue them. Because you don't pursue them, you're not around them. Because you're not around them, you don't talk to them. And so, of course, you're not like them because you don't like them. It's the same way with Jesus. If you have an area, we have areas in our lives that aren't like Christ. Well, that's the area in our life where we don't like Christ. We won't become like Jesus if we don't like Jesus. Disciples like Jesus. Let's get real simple. Why did I marry my wife? I like her. Why do marriages fall apart? They stop liking each other. Oh, that's for somebody in here. But anyway, here we go. First John chapter 5, verse 3. Here we go. Disciples like Jesus. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Disciples don't view the commands of God as a burden. They're built up by the word of God, not broken down by it. Disciples follow the will of God, the commands of God, the rules of God, because they actually want God to rule their lives. They actually want it. But let's be honest, at times, speaking about myself, I don't want to. I just don't want to. Tim, do you want to pray? Nope. Do you want to read? Not really. Do you want to sing? Not again. I just don't want to. And I've heard it said this, that God doesn't want robots. And so this is what happens. We justify uh, our sin, actually, is no other really cute way to put it. We think God is going to let us off the hook because we say this about him. Because he wants us to love him from a pure heart, I'm not going to be fake about it, so I'm just not even going to follow him. But here's the thing. We're not off the hook. You know why? Because God already thought that through. He's so much smarter than you, right? And me, right? So this is what he did. He's so generous. He's so gracious that he will give you the want to want to. Let me say that again. <laughs> You're not off the hook when you don't want to when you don't want to follow him because he's so awesome. He will actually give you the want to want to. He'll give it to you. Tim, where is that in the Bible? I'm going to show you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Tim, break that down. Well, God gives us the desire to do what he created us to do for his glory. We please God because God puts in us the motivation and the power to please him. How many of you know the, you're familiar with the greatest commandment? You should love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, soul, mind, and strength. But do you know what the Bible says how that happens? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Do y'all see that? God circumcises our hearts so that we can even begin to love him. You want more scripture? I got some more. Ezekiel 36, beginning verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Listen to the words of God. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And, and from all of your idols, I will cleanse you. Verse 26, and I will give you a new heart. 
and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. How beautiful is our God? Y'all don't mind that I brag on him a little bit. Listen, the Bible says God cleanses us, gives us a new heart, fills us with his spirit so that we can follow him. Church, God will give you the want to want to. But Tim, I don't want to. That's all right. He'll give you that too. Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34. For this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Listen, church, God removes our sin remembers them no more and teaches us who he is by writing his very law on our very hearts. Whew, man, let's put this all together. I know I'm saying a lot. Well, come right, come hungry, right? I'm feeding. All right. Let's put this all together. So God circumcises, God cleans, God removes, God gives, God fills, God writes, God teaches, God forgives so that we can know love, know his grace, and walk according to his will for his glory. Praise God for God. Praise God for God. How about this? Listen, listen, listen to these precious truths, these promises. I'm not trying to show you how smart I am. I'm trying to show you how faithful God is. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Let me say that again. Are you sanctifying yourself? Mm. Now may the God of peace sanctify peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He will surely do, do it. How about the grace of God? What if I told you grace does more than save us? Titus 2, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Why do I want God? Why should you want him, desire him, hunger and thirst for him? Because God sanctifies, God trains, God redeems, God purifies, so that we, his bride, don't have to be afraid of the day of judgment because it's not our righteousness that's going to be judged. We're found in Jesus. And we're going to be spotless and blameless because of what he did for us. Some of us fear the second coming of Jesus, but the spirit and the bride say, come on. I don't know if you've ever seen The Matrix where Neil goes, what up? <laughs> I'm not afraid of Jesus, nor should you be. Nor should you be. Jesus gives his disciples the want to want to. Why? Let me, let me close this. Here we go. Because it takes God to love God. It takes God to love God. It takes Father, Son, and Spirit to love Father, Son, and Spirit. It takes God to love God. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Have you ever prayed, hey, God, help me, uh, help me talk to you more. Help me, help me read my Bible. God, help me pray to you more. Have any of you ever prayed that prayer? You know what's crazy about that prayer? Are you empowering yourself? Is that your spirit praying to God or is that the Holy Spirit? Oh, I'm a go. I'm a go, JR. I'm a go. Are you that good? <laughs> right? So when you pray, look how cool this is. When you pray, hey, God, help me pray. He's like, already doing it. Maybe not in that voice, but 
He's already doing it. He's giving you in that moment the will, the power, and desire to even ask. You did not go on your knees because you thought you should. The Holy Spirit is doing that. He's doing that. He's already answering that prayer. One of the values here at Radiant Church is that we are spirit-empowered. Spirit-empowered. What does that mean? Well, one, 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 one uh, take on that is this. We believe it actually takes the Holy Spirit to live a holy life. We believe that. We believe that, right? That the Father is so gracious that he didn't just give us Jesus, he actually gave us his spirit. Can I preach a little bit? Come on, y'all. Hey, Caleb, this one I wish I had an organ, like, mm -mm, this one I wish. So don't, don't do it. <laughs> Seriously, I don't want to get fired. Okay, here we go. So watch this. Jesus was on the cross, right? Y'all remember what he said? He said, it is, but he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished, but he didn't say, I am finished. They put Jesus' body, we just sung this in worship. They put Jesus' body in a tomb, but he didn't stay there. The Holy Spirit rose Jesus from the grave. Jesus ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. But guess what? He didn't, he's not just sitting there, he's working. He's working. He kept his promise to the disciples to send an, another helper, the spirit of truth that will dwell with them and be in them. So the spirit that went inside Jesus' tomb is the same spirit that lives inside of us. The spirit that descended on Jesus after his baptism is the same spirit that baptizes believers for his glory. Come on, church. This is the Holy Spirit. God will give you the want to want to. It takes God to love God. And the third person of the Holy Trinity will change you and transform you, not just save you. Not just save you. We can't be settled for just going to heaven because that's not the goal. Heaven's coming to earth. There's going to be a new earth and a new heaven. And I'm looking for Holy Ghost-filled Christians. What happened to the Holy Ghost? Y'all remember that language? Why are you afraid? Because you ain't got Holy Ghost power. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. I'm not afraid of ghosts. I got the Holy Ghost. I'm about to preach. But see me like... We, we got to believe these things, these truths. The Holy Spirit, we're spirit empowered. We are. Disciples, they come to understand that long before, long before they pursued the Father, that he was already pursuing them. Disciples come to understand that they love God because he what? first loved us. Disciples come to understand that they are saved and sustained by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Disciples. Well, you may be here, but like, yo, but Tim, here we go. Unlike the disciples in this story, I can't see Jesus in the flesh. Like, if I was here and I could see his beard and see the miracles and hear his teachings, I would devote my life to him. I would drop whatever I'm doing and I will follow him. So I'm a little bit off the hook because they had an advantage, right? They could actually see Jesus. We really can't see him. Well, what does the Bible have to say about that? First Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. John 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We are not off the hook because we can't see Jesus the way they saw Jesus when Jesus himself says, there's a blessing for those who believe and haven't seen me yet. There's a blessing for us, but there's more. Even though we can't see Jesus in the flesh, what if I told you you could see his body? Well, Tim, how does that act? Well, look around. If you're at home, look at yourself like, hey, look at yourself. <laughs> if you're a believer, you're a part of the body of Christ, right? How beautiful is that? The church is not only the bride of Christ, it is also the body of Christ. 
The body of Christ, the church, God's people is so important to me. Why? Because I am a disciple of Jesus because of other disciples of Jesus. To be conformed into the image of Jesus, to be fully formed, to be like Jesus, we need people, we need disciples to imitate, to get close enough to see their walk, to see how they follow him, to see how they desire him. You've heard the saying, monkey see, monkey do? Let me give you a theological statement. Blow your mind. Ready? Disciple see, disciple do. It's the same. John, I mean, 3 John 1.11, beloved, do not imitate evil, but, it, but imitate good. 1 Corinthians 4.16, I urge you then, be imitators of me. What is Paul talking about? 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Christ. Yeah, you can't see Jesus, but that's no excuse because Jesus left us the church, his very body. And when I look in this crowd, yeah, I see people, but I see the very body of Jesus Christ. The body, the spiritual community. I'm here because men and women of God, disciples, they loved God enough and loved me enough and invited me into their lives to get close enough to see how much they love Jesus and taught me and trained me. There was a time in, in high school for a time where I was just homeless. There's a story how I got there. I don't have time for that, but there was a time I was living, and I was an upperclassman. There was a time I was living on the school bus that was parked in the school parking lot. I remember that time. But thank God for Miss Cousins. Who's Miss Cousins? That was the school's cafeteria lady who loved Jesus. And she invited me to stay with her and her family. Why am I hospitable? Why do I love having people in my home? Why do I love inviting myself to your homes? <laughs> Why do I desire that everyone knows that they're known, loved, and cared for? Because a disciple with a hairnet and an apron showed me the love of God and let me be a part of her family. Yep. I thank God for this church called Mechanicsville Christian Center. I just came to the Lord. I was new. Grew up in the inner city. This is predominantly white church, all in the county. And they said, hey, you want to come to this thing called total worship? I'm like, what is that? It's a worship service. What is that? <laughs> We're going to sing songs the whole time? <laughs> right? I'm being real. We're going to sing, that's all we going to do? <laughs> yeah. All right. I show up. Man, I didn't know any of the songs. I barely knew anybody. And this is early 2000s, so don't judge me for this, Caleb. Ready? The song Shout to the Lord came on. And, I, and I'm not talking about, don't, not the shout, not that one that I grew up with. I'm talking about, y'all remember Shout to the Lord? Y'all remember that one? Woo! That thing came on. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> and there was a line that changed my life. Mountains bow down. I'm from the city. I, only, I saw a deer in my 20s for the first time, all right? Mountains bow down and the seas will roar. Y'all know at the sound, sing it, of your... And the church, y'all know how y'all all do? Y'all raise your hands at the same time? I'm sitting there like, I don't know what's happening! And I began to raise my hands and start crying like, what is going on? It's the first time I felt the presence of God. So why am I passionate about worshiping God through song? Because disciples of Jesus love Jesus enough to sing to him for hours. And even though I didn't know the song, I knew they were singing to God, and I knew that God was in the room. It changed my life. It changed my life. I need disciples. Why am I here behind this pulpit today? Because of men like Pastor Lee and Pastor Sonny, who have their own families, they have their own schedules, their own problems. When my family and I were going through a hard time in Virginia, picked up the phone multiple times just to check in on me, just to make sure that I was okay. Because of people like Pastor Lee and Jane who were willing, 
willing to move my family from Virginia in the middle of a pandemic so we could be a part of the family of God called Radiant Church. I can see God. I can feel the heartbeat of God when I, hug, when I hug the men and women of God. I know he loves me. There's so many others that I can think that comes to mind, but here's the point. The body of Christ, we need disciples. We need to once again be disciples. People who want Jesus. People who once again find Jesus. People who follow Jesus. People who, who surrender to the will of God, who want to be fully formed to be like Jesus, which is a lifelong journey. It's not perfection he is after because he's already perfect. It's progress. It's progress. The disciples in Scripture were commissioned to make disciples from every nation, weren't they? Well, here's the key. You and I have that same mission. We've been given the same mandate. Think about this. When Jesus went to heaven, aren't you happy that he left his disciples? Why is that important? Well, Jesus didn't take his disciples with him so that we could see him. Jesus wanted us to believe the gospel. Well, if he took all his disciples who knew the gospel, who was going to share the gospel with you? Aren't you happy that somebody at some time told you about Jesus? I am. That's why I'm here. In Matthew 28, you see the, the Great Commission. And uh, I actually want to go there real quick. In Matthew 28, listen to this. This is our mandate as disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, Matthew 28. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'm just using my holy imagination at this moment, but stay with me. Know what I think the biggest motivating factor it was for these disciples to make disciples of all nations? I don't think they were just as excited about the activity or the teaching or anything like that. I think the promise that Jesus was going to be with them no matter where they went was the motivating factor for them to work for him. Because more than anything else, they wanted Jesus. Well, Tim, where you getting that from? Y'all remember in John, they're like, hey, can we go with you? Can we go with you? Take us with you. He's like, mm -mm, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. They wanted him so bad that I believe that Jesus, he's so brilliant. He says, hey, when you do this work, I'm with you in a special way. Yes, God is everywhere all the time, but this is a special with you. When you go and make disciples, when you go and you proclaim the gospel, when you go and teach people to observe what I commanded you, I am going to be with you. And these men got to see God in flesh for three years. He's leaving, and Jesus knows to motivate them, I have to tell them that I'm going with them. But is that enough to motivate you? You know what should motivate us on mission? More than hell, more than certain nations, more than certain people's groups, because Jesus is with us when we do his work. Jesus is with us. Do you, do we want Jesus? People need to see disciples. When I came to the Lord, the Holy Spirit just began to do some crazy work in me. He gave me like a true hunger and desire for the word of God. And so much so when I was a, a basketball player at that time and I wanted to get trained and God sent this man of God by the name of Seth Franco, a, far, a former Harlem Globetrotter. And, and I saw him play. I'm like, man, this dude can ball. So I came up to him. I was like, hey, Seth, would you train me? And I just came to the Lord. He said, I would train you, but this is what you have to do. You have to get a Bible. You have to start in Genesis. You need to read X amount of chapters a week. And then you need to write down what these chapters mean to you. And before we even touch a basketball, we're going to talk about Jesus. And when I didn't have my chapters and I showed up, he was like, bye. <laughs> he did that. You know what's crazy? Many years later, I graduate from a school of ministry. And the gift he gave me was those scriptures and those chapters that I wrote when I was 16 years old. That's a disciple. And that's how you make disciples. 
I want to invite us all. Please stand. Please stand. Let's, let's respond to God tonight. And if you would, just close your eyes and Tonight, I want everyone here to want Jesus. I want you to be able to see him just like John the Baptist. The call is behold him. Don't look at me. Don't look at this thing. Look at him. Look to Jesus. And if you're here tonight and you've, you've never placed your, your faith, your trust in him, you know I'm not even going to... Go long. You know if you have a relationship with God or not. Maybe you just don't. And maybe you feared rejection. And maybe, I don't know what it is. But you just know that there's a, a gap, a separation between you and Jesus. Well, you're not here by accident. And today, if there's anyone here who says, you know what, I, I, I want to I follow Jesus. I, I want to know this man that that the scripture talks about. I, I want to start this relationship. I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. And yeah, I, I do feel that I'm under this weight. I do feel like God isn't around. And, and maybe you just want to start afresh, start anew. I just want to pray for you quickly. If that's you tonight, would you just raise your hand so I could just pray for you? I see that hand. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. Praise God. Let me pray. Father, we, we love you. Jesus, we adore you. Holy Spirit, we desperately need you. And I ask you right now, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in the lives of those who are saying, I want to see Jesus. I, Give me the desire to even desire him. Holy Spirit, do a supernatural work. Give them a hunger and a thirst. Father, would you draw people into Jesus so that they can be saved, so that they can be forgiven, so that they can experience the grace that you already purchased. Father, show them who your son is. Show them that he is Lord. Show him that what he did on the cross was enough. And that he rose again with all power in his hands. Like, God, please reveal Jesus to them. In Jesus' name. Tonight for closing, with the way I, as I was preparing, I thought it would be a great way for us to close this. For all of us who know the Lord, who are disciples, to sing this old song but good one it's an oldie but goldie it's a song that I remember even before I came to Christ that people like my grandma and other saints would sing and other disciples would sing and it's just like I have decided to follow Jesus not in a legalistic way but will we recommit will we consecrate ourselves to the Lord and say man I, I'm deciding to follow you but let's take it to another level. Jesus is calling his disciples not just to follow him, but to go and make more followers, to actually help people come to know and see the Jesus that we trust. So when we sing this song, you're not just deciding to follow him personally. We're not even just deciding to follow him corporately. We're saying we're making the decision tonight to follow him and to, for him to take me wherever he wants to take me, for him to use me so that people will come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and we will teach them the ways of God. We will preach, we will prophesy, we will pray, we will sing and we will worship in such a way that people who don't know Jesus will begin to desire him. People will come and look at us and say, there's something different about you. And we're not going to say it's because we're great. We're going to say because God is great. And you need to know the God that we know. So when we sing this song, it's not just something cute. It's a declaration powerfully saying that I am going to I'm going to decide to follow Jesus. If Jesus turned the world upside down with 12, there's more than 12 people in this room. Let's follow the Lord. Let's change the world. Let's not be afraid of the darkness when he's called us to be the light. Let's sing it out to Jesus. Come on, I have decided. Let's sing. Jesus, I have decided.
Every voice. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. Make the decision to follow Jesus. with all our hearts, I have with all our souls, to follow Jesus. with all our strength. No turning back. The cross. Come on. The cross before us. Come on. The world. The world behind. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. How about this? Throw no gun with me. Yeah. Let's do that. This is a big one. This is a big one. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Yes, come on. Just the voices. I have decided, just the voices. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. We love you. We love you. We'll see you next week. Love you.